Yes. Hello. I'm Gabe Mack, and I am hosting the Game Beyond Live. That's right. We're going to get into some stuff about game design and new media, serious game design, and how we can make the world a little better using games. I hope you'll join me for this little uh, powwow. And if you haven't already, go ahead and jump over on to our Discord channel. That's right. Go over to our Discord channel and join in on the chat. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm here. <laughs> nice to see you all. Have a quick sip here. Oh. Okay, so um, what are we going to check out today? Well, I've got a couple of things lined up. Um, first of all, if you haven't already yet checked it out, uh, we have a new and improved, I would say, or more improved, old and improved. Ah, it's new and improved, I guess, if you're going by the, the whole advertising uh, uh, shtick, I guess you would say, of our game design introduction course. That's right. So let's have a check here. You can go over to school.gamebeyond.com and check out the Game Design Basics course. There's about 40 different uh, clips in there and six different modules that take you through the basics of designing video games. Now, if you have any questions about this course, please hit me up on Discord or hit me up in the chat, live chat, and I can take you through some of depth. Oh, it looks like, I hope the video didn't freeze. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're back. Um, so yes, please go ahead and uh, give me a check. Oh, I realized I didn't actually put it. So there it is. Here you go. Sorry, this is the school.gamebeyond course. If you go to school.thegamebeyond.com, We'll come to our new and improved school, online school, right? Right now we have, like I said, the beginner um, game design basics. I'm currently in production of a couple more. I just um, finished recording and now I have to edit and put it all together. A uh, course on presentation technique to help you get over the fear of public speaking. And we've got some serious game design and serious game design production courses coming up, as well as editing, the theory of editing, and some special effects uh, courses coming up too. So we've got a whole bunch uh, coming up and lined up here for 2022. And I really hope that you're going to uh, come along on this journey of starting this uh, brand new school. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, anybody's in the chats here? Uh, ta -ta -ta, ta -ta -ta. Don't see anything yet. Okay. Well, that's all right. This is, you know, the first the first weeks. I don't expect uh, people to jump around uh, right away. So, yeah. Um, Game Beyond, we've actually reached. I'm actually very, uh, very proud of this. Um, let's go to the news. Doo -doo -doo. Um, I mean, the news. Here we go. <laughs> so, yeah, the news. We hit uh, 2,000 students, which is quite uh, an accomplishment. It did take... You know, only five years of of having uh, you know this course online, but you know, two thousand students that's pretty good. I'm happy about that. I I hope that you will join those two thousand, or if you're one of those two thousand, you'll continue your journey along with me. All right, so that's good news. I uh, enjoyed that. If you haven't, if you are a student and you haven't yet. Go ahead and jump into the Game Beyond Students uh, Facebook page. We've got a Facebook page here, you know, with uh, different topics and stuff uh, for those of you who have joined one of our courses. And, of course, you know, we've got the uh, the Game Beyond page right here where, you know, we, we put out all this information of, you know, what's going on, who's where what. This is a very uh, interesting little a uh, bit of research that uh, uh, I think it would be neat to uh, talk about in a minute. Or we could talk about it right now, actually. Um, so, yeah, this is a pretty interesting little article. It talks about how video games could be tools for historical research. Now, not necessarily that, you know, uh, we're using video games and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden discovering new things about, you know, Julius Caesar or something. No, this is mainly a paper that was done 
by a bunch of uh, students, I believe, at uh, Gul University in Turkey, um, where basically they researched how could you use historical simulation games, most of them were from Paradox, in fact, I think practically all, um, to actually help teach and understand history inside educational courses. And what they found, so they did a, a, a couple of different um, uh, checks, so to say. Um, here, let me turn on my... There we go. Uh, they did a whole bunch of different checks. For instance, you see here we got uh, Sid Meier, uh, Civilization they used. They used to the Total War series. Um, they use grand strategy games. They also use Crusader Kings, um, Europa, Universalis, um, Hearts of Iron. Now those are mostly by Paradox. And what they uh, what they found is that it's interesting. Certain games actually helps understanding of certain uh, eras in in history. So when we go, uh, okay, we can. Do -do. I said hide. There we go. I got to learn the, the quick combos for that. So let's check out. Um, we have a couple of uh, examples here. Let's uh, let's open up uh, some of these games here. So let's first let's take a look at Crusader Kings here. Let's have a look at this. So this is just a quick launch trailer for Crusader Kings. And you are playing the role um, of the king of Castile. Oh. And you are having rather a bad you hear day. that? I hope you hear that. The high cost of maintaining reason. an army has entirely depleted your oh. treasury, and your soldiers have begun to desert. You well, can see you it can, now. You might be a hearing Muslim it invasion double, surging over that. your yes. land. You um, might reach but yeah, this is a Crusader Kings, but and alas, your character Kings fervently believes was, himself possessed um, by the devil. Pretty good this for has made helping studies of medieval period well, somewhat of a for students. Now, has it I've that played your Crusader brother, Kings, King and Leon, we might even go ahead and play it on this you. channel. But your um, it is has incredibly nothing useful to difficult. The and swine's tongue has grown conveniently still as you you're start dealing with, with his wife. Um, all kinds of taking over you find of find yourself different friendless, countries penniless, and possessed, territories and entirely and not in the dark, just by with the Moors going in and using your armies, but also by basically marrying off you know your sons and daughters and etc and forming your bond so it really gets into you know how educated the, the royal families are you know and it gets you uh, understanding oh how could it be that basically you know three cousins you know the czar of russia the czar of germany and you know the king of uh or not the czar the uh the king this of Russia, the your king of, of uh, course, or rather, Persia, it would and the king of England, you know, basically started the World the War I when they're all sway. nephews, you know. Demonic this gives a very interesting part. understanding about how the that all can work together. Not only have you now, your the other uh, plot, game, which uh, was being used and apparently went quite highly, was the game Europa Universalis the Fourth, I believe, yes. IV, yeah. And this is a game I haven't played myself, but this uh, game apparently was really good to help study the modern era to the industrial ages. I mean, personally, I like, you know, Civ 6 for something like that, but I'm definitely going to have to check out uh, this game. I haven't played it yet uh, to see how, how well it actually is at, um, you know, really, really getting some understanding about that era and that age. It's, you know, been quite popular. It's been around for for a number of years now, so it's uh, not a, not, none of these are really new games, uh, which is nice because that means you can probably find it for a pretty good discount somewhere if you're, uh, if you're looking. So the, uh, the next uh, game which was apparently rather well received within the study. And specifically, um, this is Hearts of Iron 4. 
And this is specifically good, apparently, for Paradox the early the to mid grand strategy century. war game, um, challenging you is, to prepare you know, and lead a nation like through the greatest conflict in human game. history. Um, Over the years, the game expanded, and the tools have, of history have evolved. You know, Together for victory, let you direct on. the course of the imperial dominions, choosing the usual path of loyalty to the crown or a path to total independence. Death or dishonor pose the greatest challenge so far. Lead Central Europe's minor nations, trapped between three armed camps, seeking a safe destiny amid fiery tumult. Waking the Tiger, focused on China's life or death struggle for unity against the imperial might of Japan, with new options to control even greater armies. Man the Guns lets you rewrite the history of the great democracies and customize your war fleets. You have rewritten the past countless times over three years. What mm -hmm. comes next? So that's Hearts of Iron. Hearts of Iron 4. And, um, uh, just pause that there. And apparently these are three games that are good for helping teach and understand these various eras through history. So if you are a history teacher out there and you haven't quite figured out how to engage with the students, maybe some of these games might help. Now, what the study did is they essentially had the students play the games and then they had them write essays about what they experienced compared to the historical records of what happened. So, you know, you, you could also take this to, for instance, levels of creating a simulation whereby the Battle of Waterloo is re-fought in a, you know, tabletop uh, type of manner, um, whereby the students learn, you know, mistakes or what happened at these various battles. Now, the, that's we've seen before. This is taking it to a whole new level whereby now as a, as a student or as a player, we can actually do an arc of many hundred years of development of a society and the politics and the culture, uh, the territories, the resources, all of these different things that have a factor in the shaping of our modern day world. So... Yeah, a lot of fun, a lot more fun uh, could be had if we uh, maybe started using some games in the schools. Now, for those teachers out there, these are three really good um, uh, school papers I, or, school, or games that you can play inside of school. Now, let's see. The, I'm going to look for the article itself. Yeah, we saw the article itself, didn't we? Yeah, here it is. So yeah, here's the article, and it's actually a pocket article. And if you you know jump over and follow us on you know either Twitter or on Facebook, you'll also see a link to the article there, and you can read more about it yourself. Yeah. All right, excellent. So, how is everybody doing, huh? Everybody doing well? Oop, is it all gonna? F oh no, we're okay. <laughs> I thought it would, went all uh, wacky there for a second. Okay, quick sip. And on to the next bit. So I wanted to, well, many of you might know, and most of you probably don't, that this past week was, of course, the week of the dude. I'm being a fellow dudist, and that means I follow the way of the Big Lebowski from the film The Big Lebowski. You know, take it easy, dude. Let's go bowling, right? So I thought in line with, you know, uh, the week of the dude and the day of the dude, I would do a little talk about the history of bowling, which I kind of preluded to last week, but you know, now my, many, many of my game students may already have uh, seen this talk, um, but I'm sure that uh, many of the online game students have not yet. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump right into it. Let's see, what which kind of uh, setup do I need for this? Oh yeah, I need that setup. All right, good. And let me go over here to start this thing. Right, here we go. Let's see if this works. 
All right, there we go. The history of bowling. Now, I've of course, for those of you who love the film The Big Lebowski, um, the the movie is rather centered around bowling, and I've been you know taking my little dude action figure all over well actually he's more of a non-action figure but uh, i've been taking him all over the world with me you know taking various pictures this is actually a picture from a bowling alley in munich germany it's uh, below a, a steak restaurant and in germany they actually call it kegel and we'll get into that later but yeah bowling has been around for a long time in fact we think it dates back to about 5,000 years ago, right? So bowling actually had its roots in ancient Egypt. And we've actually had evac um, excavations which have uncovered structures that are much like a bowling alley and found balls that were used to play. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. So... Um, first of all, the uh, the game was played with a lane about four meters long and 20 centimeters wide, and it had a pit in the middle that was about, oh, two centimeters deep. Here you can see the uh, the ball and actually the uh, one of the bowling alleys. It was actually kind of underground in there that they excavated out, and if you look at this game this is what we think they were playing so we think that or historians believe that the game was played by basically two opposing sides that would try and roll their balls toward the center of the alley and get it into that little middle lower section pit now the player which had the most balls in the middle pit would win yeah um, that's what historians believe the game rules were. Um, we see very similar roots of those same game, game mechanics in games such as Patunk or Jeu de Boule yeah? or uh, Bowls. Yeah? These are all various uh, variations of essentially this game. So that's there we see, you know, it, it, it kind of the roots of all of these bowling games, but Patunk and Show to Bull and, and Bulls, that's all, the, where, where's, where's the pins, right? Where's the pins? Well, that's when the game actually took a shift in about 300 AD in Germany. So actually Germans, the nihilists, yeah, were huge on bowling. And actually it was these... Germans that actually invented the bowling that we have today, adapting it from this Egyptian ancient game. And what they would do is in, you know, 300 AD, we see these parishioner sticks arrive. So the Germans, they would have these, you know, it's like these walking sticks that you go up into the hills and, and you know, depending on the number of mountain peaks you've climbed, you have all these little, you know, nooks and things in it. And what they used to do is parishioners, they would put their sticks up and they would knock them down by throwing stones, right, at it to absolve of their sins. So, you know, it's like, oh, I've got three sins, you know, of, of lust, gluttony and, and laziness, you know, oh, put those three sticks down, hey, knock them away. So it was really interesting when a German historian, William Peel, asserted that bowling actually began in his country in 300 AD. Well, it didn't actually start in his country. It actually goes back much further to Egypt. But the Germans did adopt a new component, which was the stick. And that's when everything started to go crazy because this idea of knocking down these sticks became very popular. In fact, so popular that King Edward III banned bowling in 1366. Yep. And he he basically, you know, outlawed it essentially or well, allegedly because his troops were focusing far too much on bowling rather than archery, right? So that was uh that was the first time, the first time, but not the last time that bowling 
was banned. Now, Henry VI actually reversed the ban in 1455. And then, you know, it was like, you know, 15th century London briefly became, you know, the heaven to, you know, the all weather bowling alleys and doors again. You know, well, you know, Henry VI, he was, you know, French. So maybe he liked the petanque or jeu de boule uh, a bit much. Now, anyways, so that was in 1455. So, you know, we basically had, you know, some almost 100 years in England that bowling was banned bastards now over in germany we run into martin luther now i'm not talking about martin luther king jr no i'm not talking about the original martin luther that you know shook up the catholic church with his post-it note all right now apparently martin luther was a really avid bowler so much so that he actually had a bowling alley at his house that he would play with his grandchildren now martin luther up at, well, you have to understand, up until that time, until the you know, 1500s, basically, they would pay with the all number of pins. They would have, you know, basically six pins. They would have 12 pins. They might have four pins. They might have 10 pins. And Martin Luther said the ultimate perfect divine number to play bowling is with nine pins. And it was basically in the shape of a diamond. Yeah. And so the name nine pins became synonymous with bowling for hundreds of years. And we see in the 1500s, this popularity rise again. In fact, um, it was uh, Sir Francis uh, Drake who uh, accordingly on July 18th in 1588, when Drake was uh, on the lawn playing a game of uh, bowling, a messenger from the Spanish Armada, uh, or a messenger came and said that the Spanish Armada was, appro was approaching. And Sir Francis Drake said, we still have fought time to finish the game and thrash the Spaniards too. Well, according to legend, he lost the game, but he did win the war. But that didn't matter. No, 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 because he was actually, uh, uh, I mean, again, you know, we got Henry VIII here who banned nine pins for the poor in 1541. Basically, he said, no, you got you to gotta pay a tax, a fee of 100 pounds. Now, this is back in the 1540s, 100 pounds. That's like, that's like 100,000 pounds a day. Just to play a game of bowling wasn't the elitist mother yeah. So he felt compelled to legislate against the sport again in the 16th century. And he declared that only the wealthy could bowl uh, convenient for him since London's Whitehall Palace had recently been rebuilt with outdoor bowling lanes. Oh, yes. You cannot play this game, but we can, you know, Henry VIII. So, yeah, it goes on. Um, how so Henry VIII declared that anyone could, who uh, kept a bowling green had to pay a fee of 100 pounds. However, the green could only be used for private games, and the edicit forbid anyone to play a bowl or bowls in open space out of his own garden or orchard. So that means, you know, artificers, laborers, apprentices, services, and the like were completely forbidden from playing bowls or bowling except in their master's house and in the presence at Christmas. The sport would have been played as a part of the 12 days of Christmas. That was still allowed. That was enjoyed during Tudor England. You know, that's when you get the whole Boxing Day. And it's kind of which provided the working class an opportunity for rare pleasures such as visiting a zoo or watching plays and jousting matches and apparently also bowling. Yeah? And now... In 1555 comes along Queen Mary, and she even outlawed the game on Christmas. Yeah, because she said it provided cover for unlawful assemblies of seditions, conspirators, and convincilias. Yeah, that's the dude in his team. You got dude, the Walter, and, uh, you know, and Donnie. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of conspirators, man. Yeah, yeah, I was one of the... Uh, Original writers of the port here on uh, stay, you know, not the watered down second version. <laughs> so, yeah, Queen Mary figured it out that these bowlers, 
Uh Uh-uh, they were no good for her reign. Now, moving on, King James, yeah, he banned bowling also on Sundays in 1618 when he issued the Declaration of Sports, which banned bowling on Sundays, but did allow dancing and archery as one of the first attended, as one first attended a church service. At this time, of course, you know, the uh, the game was called Nine Pins because of uh, it was so popular. And then I think personally that, you know, the basically, you know, the, the Brits had had enough and they wanted to go bowling. They'd had enough. So they went to America. <laughs> right. And so then we see in uh, basically in 1609 that nine pins comes to America through the Dutch East Indian Company. And, you know, the explorer Henry Hudson colonizing New Amsterdam, uh, actually, when it was called Henry Hudson was actually Dutch. So he brought this over from the Netherlands. But those of you who really know your your history know that quite a lot of the uh, first settlers uh, and the pilgrims didn't actually come from England, but they came through the Netherlands first. And if you don't believe me, check out the Leiden uh, church that they built. Yeah, they built a whole church in Leiden while they were waiting. Anyways, um, that's a whole nother story. But yeah, Hudson's men brought some form of this lolling ball game with them. In fact, today... In New York, you can see the Bowling Green, which is the original park during that day in which the English, the Dutch, and the German settlers invariably came together and they would play bowling. Now, this is, you know, uh, the one of the earliest mentions of in serious American literature is by Washington Irving. Um, when Whip Van Winkle awakens the sound of crashing nine pins, the first permanent American bowling uh, location was right here in New York, right next to the Charging Bull, right in, uh, in New York's Battery Park, right on the edge there. And get this. Even though it's the oldest park in New York, even though it's got the oldest fence around New York, you still cannot go onto the grass now and play bowls. So yet again, <laughs> it is illegal to play in New York. So here we have another round, right? So let's check out what happened. Why is it that, you know, what, what, what goes further in the story? Well, what happened was in America in 1841, nine pins was also made illegal in New York City. Yeah, it was, uh, um, I forget which uh, mayor it was, but, you know, the 1st of January in 1840, these Knickerbocker alleys, as they were called, um, all of a sudden started opening up and they brought in, instead of nine pins, which was basically banned in several states to combat gambling, except for Texas. Texas is the only state in America that you can still play nine pins. They just added another pin and called it 10 pins. Or bowling. So instead of doing the diamond, they basically did uh, the the triangle shape, and that is the game that in North America we know and love and play today. And in fact, if you look in different parts of the world, you'll see that you know these different versions of the game actually exist. So. For instance, in the States, we have, you know, our standard pins, we have duck pins, and we have candlestick pins, but we all always use 10 pins mostly. Now, in uh, Europe, they have what's called Kegel, um, and that's typically nine pins that is used instead. And actually, up in uh, up in Canada, I'm not sure why, but they, they just went with five pins. They said, no, nah, we'll just do half of what America does, and we'll go five pins instead. And so... They, uh, they actually do a, a five-pin uh, bowling you can find there. Now, here's some little interesting facts about bowling. Why is it called a turkey? Well, when someone scores three strikes in a row, they call it a turkey. A strike is when you knock down all pins on the first try. And the reason why they called it uh, a turkey is because back in the day, it was really hard to get three strikes in a row, even harder than today, because they didn't have the level, even, you know, uh, uh, perfect floorboards, you know, there were all the stuff. No, these were just, you know, lawns basically right and it was always uneven you know bumps would happen so as a promotional giveaway yeah they used to do promotional giveaways back then 
if you did do, um, I believe it was um, around the 1800s when they first started to, to do this, for three strikes in a row, you would get a turkey. If you did four strikes in a row, you get a ham bone, right? Six strikes in a row would be considered a wild turkey. And nine strikes is basically, you know, almost perfect game was, was then called a golden turkey. I don't think they actually, there's no recording of an actual golden turkey being given. Um, and a perfect game is actually called a dinosaur because it hardly ever happens, right? Supposedly because it's non-existent. Um, and I believe it was uh, Grazio Castellano who was the first to bowl a perfect game on live television on October 4th, 1953. Just another little bit of uh, uh, bowling knowledge for you there. So moving on to 1895, that's when the standard rules for American Bowling Congress begins, right? On the September 9th, 1895, the American Bowling Congress changed the point system from a maximum of 200 points for 20 balls to a maximum of 300 points for 12 balls and set the maximum ball weight of 16 pounds, the pin distance of 12 inches, and it was the first National Bowling Congress held the first championship then in 1901 one which really established a standardized rules for the game that we know today now one problem that you know they had which um was you know not too uh, not too many parents were happy about was they would basically employ kids back in the day to set up all the pins now that all changed luckily in 1940 when all of a sudden we got the automatic 10 pin automation system so that these kids didn't have to stand in the back and you know have these 12 pound or 16 pound balls being flung at them you know i'm I'm sure quite a few of them uh, got a busted toe or two. But yeah, this made the game uh, a lot safer in the 1940s. And this is what we all know today. In fact, um, it was uh, 1936 that Gottfried Schmidt invented the mechanical pin setter while he was at the uh, AMF firm. Yeah. Um, here's another little bit of interesting uh, news. Now, some of you that know the Big Lebowski may recognize the photograph of Nixon, yeah, President Nixon bowling, right? He was an avid bowler. In fact, um, there's been a couple of uh, bowling alleys that were in the White House. In 1948, as a birthday gift for President Harry S. Truman, they built the ground floor of the West Wing. Um, they basically created a uh, 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 bowling alley for him. Um, the lanes were unfortunately removed in 1955 to make way for a mimograph room. I'm not really sure what a mimograph is. But in 1969, um, Richard M. Nixon was said to be an advert bowler. Had one, a one a, he had a one-lane alley built in an underground space below the building's north portico. Yeah, and so since 1998 until 2013, um, well, so for many years there was a uh, bowling uh, alley actually in the White House, and we know that Truman and Nixon are both uh, fans of the game. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll we'll get another bowler in there someday. Now, unfortunately, since 1998, the U.S. has basically seen a decline in the popularity of bowling, which I think is a, a real shame. In fact, so much so that the bowling alley that was used to film The Big Lebowski is no longer there. That's right. It's been taken down, torn down. It is gone. So I'm curious what's going to happen to this game because let's be honest, it's been around for over 5,000 years. It's, it's not going to stop. There's going to be new forms and new versions of the game coming up. And, you know, one thing I do see is I, I see some really interesting video games that are playing with the game mechanics of, you know, both bowling and of uh, uh, basically uh, mini golf, you know, you got these VR mini bowling games where you're moving your bowling ball, right? You've got uh, the Wii game where people are actually, you know, playing bowling in their house virtually. So the game mechanics are solid on this game. And I don't think it's going to die. I think yet again, we will see some new version of it start to emerge. And so, yeah, that was pretty much uh, it. Um, that was the... Uh, 
uh, the history of bowling. And I hope that you en uh, enjoyed that little history of bowling there. Oh, you have gameplay. What games are playing here? Any gameplay narration I hear? No, I don't hear any gameplay narration there. But yeah, I'll have a check on that, what that might be. But anyways, um, yeah, so that was a little history of uh, bowling. Um, there we go. Uh, that was a little history of bowling. I hope you enjoyed that. And, um, you know, I was going to play a game called 911. Um, and I think that, you know, we'll, we'll probably still do that. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, give it a check here. Do, do, do. Let's see how well this does. Dun, dun. I want it to come over here. Oh, wrong window. Put you over here. There we go. All right. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> Hope you could hear that. Um, I think that we might be hearing it double. Well, I'm going to turn the sound on for you. Hopefully you can hear it. So let's go ahead and um, this is a game called 911 Operator. And it's a pretty good uh, game as far as the serious game scale goes because you are essentially a emergency call operator and you have to do the dispatch um, of the different vehicles you have to help people on the telephone with you know what they're uh, going through um, et cetera et cetera so let me just go ahead and we're gonna jump into just an example right here now one thing i love that they have about this is that the loading screens they actually have information you know first aid you know first alert first responder information about what to do for instance here we see about cold cardiopulmonary resuscitation or cpr so if you if you haven't you know remembered what how do you do cpr well not only are they going to show you later but you know they have little cheat sheets like this as a loading screen fantastic idea so let's continue they have a whole bunch of ones um you know for uh when you find an unconscious person what do you do these are the steps you know first aid for poisoning what do you do these are the steps right and you gotta look you gotta read through these because once we start the game, we got to actually help people who are on the phone with some of these issues. So I'm going to go ahead and let's check it out. Can we start deployment here? Yeah, it looks like we've got everybody. Let's go ahead and start a deployment. Now I've taken um, here. It looks like uh, I've got uh, London, England, I believe. It looks like the, the Thames right there, if I believe. And you can see basically the game is the following. We get a map of the city yeah and we can see our different units from fire uh from ambulances um police and we also see for instance this is a hospital this white mark this right here this blue mark is a um police station the red marks we can see our fire departments yeah now over here to the left we can see all the different units that we have how many crew they have um, we can see what kind of reinforcements we could possibly you know instantly pull in um, but i typically don't do that because i just use the units i have um, here we get our incident report which is going to start as soon as we hit start duty all right, operator, if you receive an information about an incident that needs searching, an estimated location will appear on the map. The possible location will be shown. All right, send a unit to the incident. So here we have an incident. So we have to send, here we go. No, we want you to go right over here. Yeah, we want you to open that up. 
we're going to wait on this because we have a hit and run suspect going on here, right? So we're sending a unit to this hit and run suspect. Let's see what's going to happen. And we have our incident report, right? Ah, okay. It looks like uh, they've picked up. No? Come on. Have a look. What's going on? Ah, okay. They're taking some time to resolve. All right. So that's they're going to check out what's going on. Alternatively, you can manually send units to the areas to search faster. Oh, so we're going to do a search and rescue here. I'm going to send a unit over here to this area to search. And I've got two cops that are going to be searching the area. Yeah? So we'll see how well that goes. Reporting. Heading over there. We're checking the different areas. Let's see if this is... I've actually... This is a new game mechanic that I haven't seen before is the search and rescue. The search is being continued as long as the vehicle stays in the sector. All right. So we're going to continue with that. All right. This Go over to the next sector. The team has finished the search in current sector. The missing object wasn't found. Proceed to another sector to continue the search. Okay. We're searching there. Doesn't look like this one's searching any. Get, get over here. All right. The team has found the object. Yay. The units will now automatically approach and solve the report. Fantastic. So let's get this guy this crew, we're going to send back over here to the center. Oh, because we got a new incident here. Ah, we need medical assistance for an injured. So let's send this ambulance right over there for some medical assistance. And we will wait on that incident. That's going to be fine. Do a quick zoom out. And let's fast forward it up. Oh, we got another incident. What's this? What we got here? Oh, so we have a double incident here. We need a gangs are fighting. So that means we need to send both police for three possible suspects who are possibly armed. And so I'm probably going to send this crew down there first together with this crew down there. And then we're going to, hey, then we're going to basically send the ambulance afterwards once we're sure that all the shooting and fighting has stopped. Oh, we have a call. 911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? Man trouble. I want to report a group of men causing trouble. Okay, where are they at? They are in the park. First thing we got to know is where are they at? They are in the park. Yeah, but what's the address? What park? Blah, 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 blah. I think we might even be in Bangkok by the look of these words. Oh, over here? Way down there? Okay, how many are involved? Four of them. Oh, man, it's a big, big uh, bloody mess, aren't they? They're acting like animals. Hey, go away. Um, okay, any injuries? Okay, no injuries. Not that they can tell. One of them... Oh, no. One of them has punched him out, and he's fallen to the ground. Jesus Christ, they're kicking him. All of them are kicking him. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we can send this group here. We're going to send the fire over there. Okay, uh, wait for help. Don't go over there, ma'am. Um, wait for help. We're going to send some cops over, over right away. We're going to send this cop down there, and we're going to be sending these the ambulance also over here after the cops get over there we're gonna let the cops go now we're gonna let the ambulance go and we're gonna send an ambulance down here as well boy we got some incidents going don't we my goodness let's see how many incidents here we go we've got a minute left oh it's been a minute so far on that okay oh looks like they're engaged we got two cops down there we got someone that's hurt i hope I hope our uh, crew isn't getting hurt. Uh, we got medics on the scene. Medics are on the scene. They're now helping. They're going to resolve that in about 20 seconds. Looks like we got some more cops on the case. We got some more cops here. Under fire. Need back Your backup is right there. There's the backup. See, now they got the backup. 
Yep, they got back up. Oh, we got another incident down here. What's going on? Oh, no, we've got some kind of drug dealer going on. Uh-oh. They're under fire, too. We've got a fire going on as well. Oh, my goodness, we're going to get this fire uh, problem going. And where are all my cops? I got all my cops are under fire. Everyone, okay. Let's get the bandwagon set up. You go solve that issue over here, Mr. Police. And we got a new call. I mean, this is why it's such a stressful <laughs> occupation, right? Okay, 911. Help, my kitchen is on fire. Okay, uh, what's your address? Quickly. Uh, okay, you're calling from there. All right. Okay, so what's on fire, first of all? There's oil in the frying pan. Okay, so do we use water, use an extinguisher, use a damp towel? I'll send firefighters. What we're going to do is oil in the frying pan. Use an extinguisher. You have a fire extinguisher. No. No? Okay. Um, then you're going to have to use a damp towel if you don't have a fire extinguisher. Let's see what happens. You don't want to throw water on an oil fire. <laughs> It'll explode. So let's see if the damp towel will tell. Done. I guess everything's fine. All right, fine. Everything's fine. We can we can send this back over here. Um, it's all good. That's all taken care of. Are these guys still under fire? Oh, my goodness. And then we got these guys going over here. These guys are still under fire here. Are they taking care of things? Okay, it's all resolved. This is resolved. That's resolved. Okay. So they're resolving all that. That's all pretty much. How about this fire? We got a fire going. Oh, no, it's not a fire. It's a situation report. It's an obstacle in front of there. Um, looks like we have gunshot wounds. Okay, we're running over to gunshot wounds over here. And we've got both a fire going on. Oh, goodness. We got a fire and injuries. We need to get the fire brigade over there quickly. Um, let's get this, uh, uh, medical up here. No, this medical needs to go over here. Sorry about that. Cause they're still under fire. No, they're not under fire, but they, we need to send ambulances to pick these two people up in the ambulance. Meanwhile, we've got another deal going on over here with some kind of drinking in public. Not a really big deal, but you know, we'll take care of it. Um, it looks like we've got a broken bone over here. Okay, so that's not immediately tragic. We can go ahead and send this ambulance over here to pick that up while these firefighters are going in there. Oh, my goodness. What have we got here? We've got a uh, just a little car bump. Not a problem. We'll send a unit over there to take care of that. Meanwhile, are we going to be able to help these people here? It looks like, yes, they are now receiving medical aid. And we've got a new call. 911, what's your emergency? You have to help her. She says her chest feels like it's being crushed and she can't breathe. Is she having a heart attack? Okay, first of all, where is she? In your house. And yes, where's the address of your house? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, oh, boy. We've got to send some away over there. All right. Um, any medicines? Drugs found in her purse. What should I give her? Um, I don't think you should give her anything. Um, nitroglycerin. Let's go for that. Um, what else might work? An aspirin. I'm going to say let's wait for an ambulance. It's on the way. It might take a while. In fact, I'm thinking we're going to send this one over here while we send this ambulance over here because that's more of an issue. Yeah. So this ambulance is going to skip that problem. Um, these guys are going to go to this medical facility f quickly. Um, we'll go ahead and send these guys up here to the middle. Um, has this fire been taken out yet? It's being taken out. They are not, are they, are they receiving medical? Oh, we need a medical transport over here. Okay. So first we need to get this over here. Oh, this is some 
drinking in public, not a big deal, but we definitely need more ambulances. That is, seems to be the key issue right now. Oh, now we got to send over cops to this facility as well. Oh man, somebody died. Oh, we didn't get to her in time. Well, that's a bummer. Okay. Um, in the meantime, let's send this up to here. And I think that's going to wrap it up for the day. No, we've got one more. Okay. Get over there. Everybody just jump in there. See if you can help on this situation report of, oh, that was resolved easily. Resolved almost too quickly. Let's see. How about this is the last one. We've got a drinking incident and we're done. Yeah. How well did we do? Did we, okay. We got one dead. That's, you know, that's unfortunate. Oh, well. Um, our efficiency was 31%. Um, no, we did have one injury. That's, that's unfortunate, but it looked like everything except for it. There was a CO poisoning that timed out. That's unfortunate, but yeah, this is nine 11 call nine 11. Check it out on steam. It's a really great game to play, um, to learn a lot more about, you know, uh, first aid, what to do in emergencies, you know, if there's a fire, if there's a medical emergency, or if there's, you know, people with, uh, weapons around fights, etc. go ahead and, uh, check it out. It's on steam. Great game. Um, you can play, all different locations around the world. I've played, you know, everything from Amsterdam to Paris, uh, Hong Kong to Honolulu. So, yeah. And um, anyways, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, that little uh, game there. So that's about going to wrap it up for today. Um, I've been Gabe Mack here on the Game Beyond live stream, and I hope you enjoyed uh, our uh, little little gaming trip here. And make sure to follow us, subscribe, and join in for our next week, where we're gonna have some more cool stuff about gaming and history and games, and maybe we'll get into some other. Uh, uh, classic ancient games from years ago and see how they've influenced the games that we've got playing today too all right so thank you all very much for uh coming make sure to hit that like uh, that subscribe button uh follow us on you know facebook on twitter on youtube on dlive on twitch on all those different please places and i hope you have a really playful week the rest of the week i've been gabe mac play on